I'm here with Dr. Lalich, who's a professor oh. emeritus. And I was like, I'm trying to catch, you know, I've seen you in every cult documentary almost, I think that I've ever seen. And then <laughs> we'll catch you on different podcasts and things. I was a comparative religion major and, you know, do therapy yeah. now. So uh, a lot of trauma and high control group stuff. So same kind of world. Uh, so right. uh, my interest and your interest, so I've encountered you, but I was trying to make sure like, oh, let me catch up and make sure I didn't miss anything big. And it seems like you may be more busy retired than when you exactly. were exactly. teaching full time. I don't know how you keep up with the schedule. Uh, I don't either. <laughs> and I think like the cult, I mean, you, one, if people want to hear what you have to say on this stuff, you've written about it for a long time. And you also are in almost any, you know, documentary where they might encounter that stuff. So they've. I would, my worst fear with something like this is to get a guest that said something a million times really well and then not absorb that information and be like, could you just give us cliff notes? Just tell us again, you know? <laughs> so, but you also want to give people some kind of intro into what you do. So I always kind of try and get somebody to reconsider their work from a new perspective or a bigger thing. And I mean, you've been going around since the seventies, the war, the weather underground, which was a culty time, you know, the seventies yeah. economic malaise and people are attracted yeah. to this esoteric power. You know, one of my interests is like, do you feel like, I mean, there are definitely things like the internet and the fusion of self-help with multi-level marketing, with social media, with everything that just changed the technology makes yeah. some things available that weren't there before. Right. So that's, that's happening. But do you feel like we are going back to a time where the disillusionment with, you know, right, left politics and um, the kind of atomization of people not feeling like we're part of the same project anymore of being very polarized or not even polarized because even people on the same sides don't quite agree or don't speak the same language. Does it feel like the seventies again to you? Um, you know, I was born in 87, so I missed it. You know, I'm okay. going <laughs> to fall to your perspective on this. Well, I, I think that, a lot of what happened, I mean, a lot of this change in the environment of cults and high control groups, you know, happened during the pandemic, the year we were sheltered mm -hmm. in. And because everybody was pecking around on their computers and, you know, and that's the, year I thought I was retiring. And then I suddenly got hundreds of emails, like, you know, my uncle, I don't want to invite my uncle to Thanksgiving. I can't talk to my sister anymore. You know, conspiracy theories, anti-vaxxers, QAnon, all that stuff. And so I think the internet, the access to the internet has absolutely expanded the environment mm -hmm. um, so that there are more internet-based cults than ever before, um, which, which has changed things in a way for someone like me, because before you always, you know, you knew where the cult was, you knew where the headquarters mm -hmm. was, you knew who the leader was, you knew maybe where their satellites were, but now it's so amorphous so, for yeah. example, with QAnon, like who was the leader of QAnon? Was it that guy and his son? Was it, you know? Mm -hmm. And and so that that makes it a little more difficult on one level. Well, there are multiple people claiming to be the original leader, while exactly. and, and followed as the original leader. While most scholars feel like the original guy is probably gone. You know that yeah. he got his, he did exactly. his, had his fun, and somebody right. else is playing with the toys. Like right. But the thing that's really different with the internet-based cults and this past, I don't know, five years or so, is that the cults, those cults or those high control groups, whatever you want to call them, are are far more polarized. And, have, and, and because of this, what we call us versus them environment, which I believe the former president, whose name I shall not mention, did a lot to encourage um, that us versus them mentality so that, you know, the anti-vaxxers, the white supremacists, whoever, you know, I think we can all remember the cases where, you know, you'd go into a store and someone would rip your mask off or, you know, yeah. so that. And there'd be somebody next to you saying, well, I'm wearing five masks. Exactly. So, you know, look how virtuous I am where you right. know, everyone was taking it to, to uh, all kind of an antagonistic extreme. Right. But the, the difference I think today is that the a lot of these groups act outward. They act out against society, which in the past, most cults didn't do that and don't do that. You know, we, we had a few cases like Om Shinrikyo, the cult in Japan that put the sarin gas in the subway. But most cults basically ruin the lives of their own members. <laughs> they don't so much have anything to do with the outside society. 
And so this is a real They difference. don't want to be seen. That's a threat. Exactly. If, if you expose it, then it looks, you know, for the lack of a better word, kind of crazy. So you, you want to say, no, no, we just want to clap for the guy on the stage and say, oh, we yeah. learned such great things. Thank you for all you did. Just don't say what he did. Or, right. or we can't say what those are, but we just want to show you how happy we are. That, right, exactly. You know. And so the, the difference today is the the um, the growth of the outward violence. Um, and, and that's obviously very troubling. Um, and it seems like that's because it's a decentralized thing. Like it isn't like there's, even if there's a QAnon guy or whatever, it's not like they're going into the meeting and he's saying, okay, Stacy, you do this this week, Ben, you do that. Someone's just reading this language on the internet. They're listening to Alex Jones. He says that the pizza restaurant's yeah. part of it. Maybe I gravitate to that. This person says whatever. And then I decide, oh my gosh, I'm going to go out and do something. Right. So, you know, is that a high control group and that I am internalizing all this information, but it's not a top down mafia structure of right. these are the orange belt, red belt, black belt, you know. It's not yeah, next no, that's different. So this this kind of I mean they're under in a way that those people are under the same kind of influence that we see in the cultic groups. But again, you can't you can't put your hand on it. I mean before you always needed personal contact to get recruited into something. But now, as we were saying, it happens by somebody logging into something and thinking, oh, that's really cool. And they start believing that. And so there's it's viral or memetic in a way. I yes. mean, you have yeah. an idea virus and a you have idea viruses and real viruses sort of yes. making each other's job easier, which <laughs> I, I don't know. I wish that the last season had a better writer, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's um, it's kind of a new world on, in that sense and and pretty frightening. I mean, I keep saying, God, I'm sure glad I don't have kids because I, I wouldn't want my kid to go to school these days. You know, the the atmosphere in our country is pretty volatile. Well, but I, I think in the same way that I mean, as someone who does have kids, not that it isn't very incredibly scary, but like you do see. You know, the, the, the 50s advertising doesn't work on the person from the 60s, you know. Yes. Now I don't want the American dream. I want to be the man from the future who drinks vodka and my deodorant sprays from a can. And, you know, right. like, you know, and then, and then the 60s advertising looks quaint the next time. You do see kids that are making jokes essentially about, like, religion and social control and, um, you know, the role of charismatic leaders politically and whatever at, like, 10 now, you know. That's yeah. what they're joking about and it's things that completely had their you know parents or who were older millennials or boomers totally under you know they didn't have those resistances until they were 30 40 you know right, because exactly. yeah. culture moving at light speed means right. that you know we're looking at you know two and five years is is almost like a generational gap now in yeah. cultural awareness and experience yeah yeah so it, it's a different world <laughs> that's for, for sure. sure i mean for i'm sure. Yeah, I'm almost 79 years old, and I'm like, wow, you know, ha even just tech. I mean, you know what we went yeah. through to get me the link for this. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, you know. So, well, when you when you look at like the way that you've been in all of these documentaries, you know, you you don't say it, but you know, you you may agree or like certain ones of them more, or like how your footage is used or something. I mean, the true criming of cults essentially and high control groups getting them getting the true crime sensationalist treatment i mean i think in one way it does give people those tools like kids are making jokes yes. about this stuff now my yes. wife didn't turn the nexium documentary off fast enough when my daughter was pretending to be asleep and was like you know mom what's a sex cult and we like we both oh, looked at each other <laughs> so um <laughs> So like, you know, anyway, they, they have, in one way, it's good that you're exposing what goes on inside of this stuff and its effect on people. But then it also is kind of sensationalizing and othering. And there's some other risks associated with it. I mean, one is kind of victim blaming, but another is pretending like, oh, look at this weird group. Look what they do. Yeah, exactly. Whereas I feel like when those movies work, you're saying, this is the norm for human behavior. You know, yeah. like I... When I was taught the Holocaust in school, I always felt like frustrated because they the way that they were teaching it in middle school was like, I think we were in sixth grade and they were like, yeah, this is this crazy thing people did. They're never going to do this again. We need to learn about it because it's just so weird and no one will ever do this. And I was like, no, no, no. You know, th this is you're telling me that this is an anomaly of human nature. But what I feel is that this is the unchecked nature of empire and impulse and id. And that our job is to hold and meet the moving target of managing these realities, not say, 
well, thank God this happened in Germany in 1940 and will never happen again. That seems no, exactly. like a silly way to teach history. I mean, so, part, you know, part of my goal has always been to basically educate the public about this. So to basically, for one reason, to destigmatize cult survivors because everybody thinks oh it's only those stupid crazy lazy people who get into cults and that's mm -hmm. absolutely not true true um but secondly to to realize that what these groups do is they use basic social psychological techniques they, they don't have yeah. to give you drugs they don't have to lock you up and hold you against your will they just slowly change your mind until you adopt that point point of view of the world so the more we can let people and and especially young people today know what the red flags are is to know what to look out for what are the questions to ask you know when when is the time to turn around and run the other direction yeah um, and and absolutely there are documentaries that focus more on the sensational aspect or do what mm. some people call trauma porn but there are there are also some some good documentaries out there that are very educational and and some film teams that actually have learned over time how to work with survivors and and uh because you know being a survivor and speaking on, on film is can be very triggering and so like i always advise these companies like have a mental health fund set up so if somebody gets really triggered you have somebody for them to talk to and don't yeah. just you know don't just upset them and let it go so yeah, reality TV has been incredibly bad at that and not taking responsibility yeah. for the things that it, it does and its participants who a mm -hmm. lot of times are not even paid. Um, it's not all the Kardashians. Right. Well, and I, I think too, like the documentary, a lot of stuff is like, well, this documentary is bad because of this decision or this one's good because of this decision. But I do feel for the directors when I'm watching certain things where it's like, if you can do a greater good by not challenging this person who, if you don't play the game a little bit, walks out of the room and then you can't make the movie and then nobody knows. I mean, you're always trying to make ethical compromises because these are people that are difficult and, you know, ephemerally culpable, some of them, or, you know, uh, a lot of the accusations that this person's just coming out because it's convenient to them. And now the camera's here and there's more money on the, on this you, side of it. You don't, you, get, know. Paid, you don't get paid yeah. to do documentaries i can tell you i mean they they cannot pay you because it, it would show bias so well, if if they fly you i mean like the, some of the people who left nexium it, it, the, being ex-nexium members was the next career which i'm not criticizing i'm, I'm just saying you know some people pointed that out um yeah you know, I, why didn't the director challenge this more and it's like well if if, if they're not on camera they're not on camera you know you right. do have to make the guests want to participate right right so <laughs> I agree. Well, I mean, so, I mean, to the, going back to the original question, like, you know, the difference in 1970 and somebody handing you a flower and a bed sheet at the airport. And now, you know, yes, the medium is not the same. The groups do not look the same. We don't have the same sort of pro uh, projection of whatever the old new age falling apart was. But is there something that is similar? Or do you feel like it's just history moves forward and this is a, a totally different time? Well, it's certainly similar in that these groups that, that get created basically use the same techniques that were used back in the 70s. I mean, there's nothing different about that. And most of these cult leaders are are far from original. I mean, that's why in, in one of my books, I say it looks like they go to the cookie cutter messiah school because they all act and do the same things. Um, so, so that remains the same, of course. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, there will always be con artists. There will always be people who want to take advantage of other people. You know, this mm -hmm. goes back to the beginning of time. So it's not like this is ever going to go away. It may change mm -hmm. shape a little bit, but, the, you know, there's always power hungry people. And, yeah. and the, the trick is not to fall under their sway. And not everybody is aware of what they're doing, which is a, a thing that makes it messier in and out of the cult and the leaders of the cult. I mean, like you. Oh, you I see, think the, leader, the leaders know what they're doing. Absolutely. They, they know what they're doing. Oh, well, absolutely. <laughs> like like when, when you watch something like Heaven's Gate, you know, I feel sorry for them in a way that I don't feel sorry for some other modern cults. You know, well, that it's just mean, these kind of. You mean, she, you mean the leaders? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I don't feel sorry for her. I feel mm -hmm. so Marshall she, Applewhite. Yeah, I mean, she was he 
she was his cult leader. She recruited mm -hmm. him. She got him into this. And he was very vulnerable. You know, he was a gay man in the South in the 50s. Yeah. You know, he had a lot of troubling incidents. And and she basically swept him up. And, and mm -hmm. you know, all along the way, I don't know. I think this is in one of the documentaries or somewhere. You know, all along the way, she was writing home to her daughter and saying, do the right thing. Go to college. You know, it's like. Okay, lady, yeah. if you really believe this, why wouldn't you go and recruit your daughter? <laughs> you know, so yeah. you know there was that kind of two faced uh, on her part, uh, and then that's what it was so sad is when she died, and and you'd see the footage in the car of them just basically being kind of gentle nerds hanging out and not understanding why everyone doesn't like them, and you know, really because you've decided this person's God and they're gone, trying to figure out how to reconnect with that, right? You and know, he it, and he was very troubled. I mean, he, you know, when that happened, he was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And so the, the, the followers convinced him, oh, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And and so he, in a sense, he was a bit of a pawn of some of the more fervent uh, followers in that group. And, mm -hmm. and I know I get flack for this all the time because I, I do feel sorry for him. I mean, I do believe he was he was exploited and taken advantage of. On the other hand, they did have a lot of perks. You know, they would leave yeah. everybody behind and they would go to Las Vegas and gamble and do all this stuff. <laughs> I was like, well, how can we be any more two-faced than that? You know, but yeah, yeah, that that was a you know, I that's the group I did my dissertation on when I went to grad school, and I certainly know tons about it and had worked with families and, um, yeah. And interestingly, that that cult started at the very same time as the the political cult that I was in. So it was again, it was that '70s environment where people mm -hmm. were checking out all kinds of different things. Yeah, the Port Huron statement launched a couple of interesting directions uh, <laughs> <laughs> for a few decades. Well, is there something about um, like politics being more aesthetic now that you think? Uh, drives that individualized, you can just project it yourself. You don't even need the cult leader. You know, like I think when you have somebody like a politician, like a Reagan or, you know, um, uh, a Carter, like they're going up and they're saying things that are political in that like, this is my policy. This is what I will do. You know, they're going to say we're Americans and values and whatever. But I mean, they were saying, you know, articulating a vision for the direction of the country. That's what I'm going to do. You can get on board with it or not. And that's politics to me. Now you look at someone like Trump who ran and I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad or good. And I'm not saying that this is my opinion. I'm saying statistically huge chunks of the young left heard what he said and went and voted for him. And as a, a guy who most people would say is pretty right wing. And he was using language about Occupy Wall Street movement, you know, a very lefty thing. Like he, he kind of ran almost like a Rorschach test where you looked at it and you saw what you wanted. I mean, one person says, oh, that guy's going to lower my taxes. Another person says, he's fighting back against the corporations that I don't like. You know, another person says like, oh, there's a culture war issue. He wants the America to look like the 50s again. And he didn't say really any of those things. He just kind of said empty aesthetic stuff that was more stylistic. And, and I think something about that lets the, I, I don't know, what do you think? I mean, do you see that changing the way that we like engage with religion and advertising and all that sphere? Well, I think that um, yeah, I think that for sure the world is far more complex now, and that's part of what uh, I think helps push people toward these groups um, or these leaders with the answers. Um, because you know, as human beings, we all want to have some kind of framework for understanding the world, and most of us want to have some kind of purpose or some kind of meaning in our life. So if somebody comes along and they have a message that resonates with you, whatever that might mm -hmm. be, like I always say, I never would have joined a meditation cult. I mean, I can't sit still that long, you know, but a political group that said we were going to get rid of racism and sexism and all the isms, you know, that sounded great to me, you know, yeah. so it has to be. And I think the fact that sometimes these leaders, the political leaders speak in a way that is vague enough that just about anybody can latch on to it. I think that's what you're speaking to. I think that does happen. Um, mm -hmm. well, I actually, it's not really tied to a policy, you know, like it's not yeah. like there's not like a cohesive politics seems to be, for lack of a better word, less political. And then no, you're it's certainly in the case of Trump, because he's absolutely an idiot, but I don't want to go into that. <laughs> yeah. 
in my opinion. <laughs> Could you tell us about the political group you got into? I don't want you to repeat your story too much, but something to give people some kind of history of how you kind of, because I think you almost have to be, have the capacity to be halfway in one of these things before you understand how they work enough to explain them and treat and help. You know, it's kind of like most people that work in this field have some kind of experience with that. And, and you've been open about yours. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was 30 years old. I, I had just moved back to uh, the United States after living on an island off the coast of Spain for four years. And sometimes I wish I was still there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I decided it was time to go back and see what was going on in America. And so I landed in San Francisco. <laughs> and <clears throat> and it was just at the end of the Vietnam War. And so people on the left, as, as like I was, um, you know, were looking for something else to do, what else to get involved in. And so for me, I, I, you know, I, I was new in town. I was making new friends. I happened to befriend a bunch of women who were political, and that was interesting to me. And then I got asked to join. First, I was asked to join a study group, which I didn't realize was a front group for this other organization. And I thought, sure, I'll join a study group. I'll meet new people. Was it SDS? No, no, no. It wasn't the group was well. The final name was the Democratic Workers Party. Okay. It had a, it had a before that it was called the Workers Party for Proletarian Socialism, and I think mm, we decided okay. that too much of a mouthful. Um, <laughs> but in the beginning, you know, one of the appeals for a lot of people was that the leader was a woman. There were always men and women in the group, but the fact that the leader and the top leadership were women made a big difference in the '70s because most of the groups on the left were male dominated. They were very macho. I remember, you know, going into some office somewhere wanting to volunteer and they go, oh, yeah, great. The ladies are here. They can make the coffee. Mm. And you're like, no, screw you. I'm not here to make the coffee. Oh, wow. <laughs> so the fact that this group was offering a women led organization, you know, that was appealing to me at that time. Right. Mm. And when I joined, I absolutely had didn't have a clue what I was joining. I didn't even know there was a leader when I joined. <laughs> mm. So, you know, it's part of that slowly 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 you get introduced to more and more and more by the time you realize what the hell's going on it's too late to get out i mean that mm -hmm. you know that, that whole metaphor of the frog in the boiling water you know yeah so, um yeah so i got a lot of sunk cost there too that you're, you've already had some good association with it and you've spent right, time yeah. so i yeah, probably yeah. can just change the course of the ship instead of leaving Right. No, in the big, you know, we did do some good work politically in in the area, and you know, so that always helped you kind of rationalize the really crappy stuff that was going on. And you know, at one point, I I, I used to say to myself, "Well, we're in the tradition of Stalin, and at least we haven't killed anyone yet." I mean, that's how <laughs> I would rationalize, you know. So, <laughs> so you know, all along the way, you do see even better things. than him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, so that was it. I was I was very involved for about 10 years. I was almost 41 when I got out. My brain was fried. Um, I luckily found a really good therapist who helped me. Um, I moved to New York to get away from San Francisco. And but it was a very grueling life. I mean, we worked from, you know, five in the morning to one in the morning, sleep deprived, had no money, ate burritos. And that was about it. And and uh, spent most of our time sitting around in circles criticizing somebody. You know, it was a very, very emotionally and psychologically battering organization. And I was, I was a top leader. I did, did all of that to others in the group. Um, so when I got out, I had a lot of guilt and shame, and um, that was difficult. I mean, I was actually suicidal for a long time. I was like, how did I become that person? Like, what the hell? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think that's a lot what people don't understand is sort of once you leave, it's, that's not over. Then there's a whole other process of recovery that takes time, which is kind of falls into your area. Well, I think that's true um, in that like a lot of that, like I've been in consultation groups or trainings where a therapist has said, you know, so-and-so left this high control group, maybe they didn't use that language, but they left this, you know, religious sect or something. And I thought, I, so I would think that they wouldn't have these politics anymore. I would think that they wouldn't have this, you know, outlook socially or something. And it's like, that's not how it works. They're just out. Like the base of your brain is still acting on all of these assumptions emotionally that vulnerability is bad. And when someone is being vulnerable, that is their fault. 
because they're not taking you know initiative or whatever. Right. I, you know, a lot of therapists listen to this uh, show and they're probably, you know, ca- you know, tra- trauma therapists. Um, and we know how to deal with trauma when the patient's saying this is trauma. We kind of know how to say, well, maybe you're being manipulated in a relationship or something or, or by a parent or a friend. But cults are kind of different. I mean, m- and you correct me where I'm wrong, but the people that I've had who come in who I suspect are in a high control group or they're telling me, I think maybe I'm in a cult. I mean, usually I know that that person has heard from everyone around them for so long. This person's so bad. He's a pedophile or he did this thing and you can't do that. And he controls you. They already have heard that intellectually, you know, right. they don't need more of that. I mean, what I yeah. open the door with is tell me about the good experiences there and why you're there. Because mm. the goal is to teach them that they don't need that group to have that experience. And they've been yeah. told you'll never have a father's love. You'll never be understood. You'll never right. have the opportunity to go to work. So that's, yeah. I mean, that's my approach, but do you have some tips for people who treat someone who may come in with that, you know, history? Well, I think it's important, first of all, for therapists to be aware of what might be the presenting symptoms, so to speak, in your language. I mean, a lot of, I, mean, I have a friend who left the, uh, the cult I was in. We were both in the same cult. She was also high level. Um, she just contacted me after 35 years. We hadn't talked in 35 years. And she said she went to therapy for about 15 years and she never mentioned the cult because she still felt loyal inside of herself. So she kind of dealt with all these issues around it. And now 35 years later, she's like exploding with emotion because she's finally realizing what the hell she was in. And and so I think being able to assess if that is someone's situation And then to tread very lightly, like you cannot confront. And this is what I tell families all the time. Like the last thing you want to do is confront the person or say, oh, Bubba, that's bad. Get out. Mm -hmm. That's only going to push them further back in. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think your approach of of saying, oh, well, what was good about it? And why did you leave? And get them to separate that. Because there always is some good. Otherwise, no one would ever be there to begin with. Um, I think that nothing that is good in a cult is original to the cult. Oh, and absolutely. so if you can find the yeah. thing that's good, you know, there's right. a lot that's original that's bad, you know, yeah. <laughs> but if you, some, you put these, you know, two yeah. Eastern yeah. words together or something. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, you know, in all the years I've been doing this, all the people I've worked with, because I get asked all the time, well, what, you know, who is, you know, as I was saying earlier, is it just stupid people who join or they're so weak or they're so this? You don't want a stupid person in a cult. Well, that, they just eat the food, man. You you get yeah. people who are so smart and have not been well understood and they have all this potential. And then you right. say the way you can actualize that potential is by doing slave labor for me. Exactly. <laughs> or sex trafficking. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, the um, you know, the thing is that pe- people need to realize I think that the if there's any common denominator of who joins cults, it's idealism, right? It's people yeah. doing it out of some wish to have a better life, change the society, find a better religion. You know, it could be even make more money, right? If you want to look mm-hmm. at the multiple and stuff. And so it's that idealism. It's the goodness in, in the person. And that's what gets twisted and turned against them. And then they're they're instilled with this fear i mean i was told if i left i would die in the streets you know i would just die in the gutter no one would want me i was a dirty ex-communist blah, 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 blah. and you know and so staying sometimes seems better than the than the fear of leaving and and mm-hmm. so working yeah you know, i'm actually going to be starting some courses for therapists that i'll be doing through my nonprofit. Oh, those um, are great I, to know about send me those when you when you get them yeah, up and we'll, we'll link to them absolutely. Yeah, because I, I've done one before and now I'm kind of regrouping and and hope to do another one again sometime in the spring, because that's one of the hardest things for people who leave is finding a therapist who understands what these yeah. after effects are and how to help them. Yeah. Do you have um, uh, I, don't, I don't know how much you overlap with therapy in your professional or personal life, but do you find that there's a style of therapy that is more helpful or a, um, you know, you know approach really- that is better? Yeah, well, I'm not a therapist, first of all, but I, what I what I advise for one is not at least not immediately using EMDR. Oh, yeah. uh, EMDR is kind of a fad right now; it's a bit of a rage. But with with it's sort of dying out, I think I think it's yes. evolved into something that works a little bit better. And it, and especially if someone's been in any kind of 
meditation cult or a cult where they went into trance states a lot, like EMDR is yeah. just going to trigger the crap out of them. So it's because I, they're very likely to be dissociative. Right. And what you're it's, doing is uncorking a dissociative disorder and right. in, in complex trauma, which is where EMDR really messes people up. I mean, yeah. you hear the horror story where the person is going to, because I was an EMDR therapist for years, um, and the EMDR people don't do themselves favors in that they don't admit where it works and why it works. You know, it does work right. for some things. Right. Um, so that's that's one caution I would make. And also, I mean, the ones that, that people have told me have been helpful were um, IFS. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been helpful to people to some degree. Um, frankly, just good old talk therapy. I mean, that yeah. people just need to talk it out. They need to kind of debrief. Yeah. And I, I would think, think an overly behavioral therapy or, or a more cognitive therapy wouldn't work because the person's mm -hmm. goals are not what really what they need. Something yeah. that was more emotion focused or parts driven like IFS, any of the post Jungian stuff would maybe help them contain yeah. the experience better. Yeah. And, would be my and, guess. And, yeah. And you don't want to tell them what to do. Like, oh, go, you know, go now and do this. And like, don't mm -hmm. tell them. They've been told what to do too many times. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's, um, but, you know, it's hard to find good therapists. So a lot, you know, I mean, that's why I wrote my book, Take Back Your Life. And I hope therapists mm -hmm. are, who think they may have that kind of clientele would read the book. Um, yeah. I always tell survivors, like, if you go to a therapist, well, first of all, I have a checklist on my website, like how to find a good therapist, like what are the kinds of questions to ask? And I try to impress upon them, like you're hiring that person, that person's working for you. And if you, you know, don't be bossed around. If you want to leave, don't tell them, oh, no, mm -hmm. you can't leave all of that, but I think it's important to uh, be able to find out is, is that therapist using any kind of gimmicks or new agey bullshit, you know, it's like, that's yeah. not going to help, you know? Yeah, the maybe, um, the, and I think I, I've heard of some styles of therapy saying kind of culty stuff to patients oh. who called and said, this was my experience. It's like, well, what did they say? You know, if your therapist says something like, well, I won't talk to that part of you, that's your trauma or something. Yeah. That seems strange. You know, I, it, some of this stuff is lifted right from those documentaries. Well, of course, there there are plenty of therapy cults, you know, cult therapists oh, yeah. who start their own little cult around them. I can't tell you how many people have come to me about that. So, um, yeah. It's, is it rebirthing it, is one of the big ones or, you know, some of the one was, one of, uh, one of my <laughs> I haven't other ever heard you talk about what's his name. Um, Who's the Canadian that did Michelle Remembers the Satanic Panic? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, for a while I was I was a colleague with Dr. Margaret Singer, who was a clinical yeah. psychologist at Berkeley, and she was kind of the preeminent cult expert at that time. And we wrote two books together, and one of them is called Crazy Therapies. Um, I have read I, it. They were, you've read it? Yeah, I yeah. love that. I'm trying to figure out how to make sure it doesn't go out of print. So I'm actually working with her son uh, to try to contact the publishers and see what we can do about bo both of the books that we did together to make sure they stay in print because they're really valuable. I mean, some of these maybe, maybe a, a second draft. There's been some crazy therapy since then. Yeah, that you say, it kind of needs to be updated. Like, you know, when we wrote that, one of the big phrases was UFO therapy. Right. Mm -hmm. And. And that's, I don't think that's so much of a thing right now anymore. I mean, that with UFOs was kind of a see it. Thing, but you yeah, see, you see it coming back, um, mm -hmm. like uh, Chris Bledsoe's book and some other things, because a lot of people, I mean, some people have an experience, I don't know what it is, you want to conceptualize it in a mystical way or whatever. I'm not telling you I'm going to fight with you about, I, I don't know how the universe works. But <laughs> what happens is that there's a lot of people who I think have had a traumatic incident like sexual abuse, and it is easier to kind of subconsciously say, well, you know, the alien did this than it is to really admit reality and heal. Yeah, and yeah. when the therapist is playing into that and not yeah. w helping you weigh things, that is very dangerous because the therapist yeah. believes in F UFOs and might be doing the same thing, but they're exactly. tra traumatic experience. Right. That's, right. That's where I see the therapy modalities become cults is where a therapist says this worked for me. It worked for everybody. And right. And, and you have to do this to get better. And if you don't do that this way, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, oh, I don't know how to get better. What do you think we should try? There's this yeah. approach. Is I have you like that? You know, on this one? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Did you, um, <laughs> did, did you ever write about the rebirthing called other than that, or the uh, psychotherapy called other than in your book, the 50 crazy other therapies? Other than crazy therapies? Um, no, I haven't written anything else about that. I mean, I've in the, 
I've had clients who went through that experience. I, I have, certainly haven't recently. Um, is that still a thing? No, Alan's pretty gone. Um, there may be some unlicensed people that kind of do something in the high hills, but mm -hmm. um, usually the, the the phases of therapy, like therapy, when it comes out, like the problem is that clinic, th there are academic cults too, because there's a lot of insecurity in academia and you get a lot of people, especially in soft sciences, where they're like extremely hostile to this new anything new and they don't and so they'll they'll take you know they'll be like well we can't quite turn this totally empirical or there haven't been 15 randomized controlled trials randomized controlled trials on it yet so it's complete bs it's not real which is too reactionary and then you have private practice which tends to move to what patients want quicker and so there there's sort of cults in there where there's tension between them i think emdr is one of the best examples because it works miracles if you look at the research like it works miracles for like 25 30 percent of people certain conditions dissociation is not one you want to use it for complex ptsd is not one you want to use it for right. um and it does nothing for about 70 75 percent of people so everybody who got better that way was like this is a miracle and they're chasing that experience and they're mm -hmm. wanting that spiritual experience with the patient they're not noticing that everyone else is leaving first or second session and then right. you have researchers that are like, that is complete crystal healing, woo-woo nonsense. There's nothing about it. There is a neurological thing happening. So we didn't understand what it was well. Something like brain spotting is way more generalizable. It's way more safe. I don't think it's the end of where that kind of me medicine's going. But you, you need an EMDR to get to that one. And when you have such hostility in academia, like it makes new models of therapy act like cults, even when they're good, which I don't think is good. And when I did like emotional transformation therapy with Stephen Vasquez, which if I hadn't read the research and if I hadn't been to the training and felt like I wouldn't believe it worked, but I was making that joke and he didn't think it was funny. And I said, he was like, oh, it's not a cult. We prefer to think of it like a family. <laughs> and it's like, oh, you already know your lines. And like, he didn't think that was funny at all. <laughs> Because he's a yeah. nice guy and it's not a cult, but it looks very weird from the outside. And there's a lot yeah. of new models that are kind of like that. So. Well, in fact, I mean, when when we wrote Crazy Therapies, which I think was in 94, 95, I mean, we trashed EMDR. I mean, there's, as you yeah. read, there was a chapter on it, but it, that, it was brand new. And it was like, oh, this woman walked in the woods and, you know, had a revelation. It's like, oh, I've heard that before. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't I, disagree with you, though. You know, I, I use EMDR where it works, but I don't disagree with the researchers take on it. I disagree with the meta analysis that say there's nothing to this. Everyone doing it's crazy. Right. right you know, right. Yeah. So, OK, we can agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> primal scream therapy. You have primal oh. scream in there, too, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure we have primal scream. Oh, my God. Primal scream. Yeah, that's another one. Oh, <laughs> there's a, I don't know, man. And I think. Uh, when the when the industry moved so cognitive and behavioral so quickly in the 80s because um healthcare got so corporatized and academia largely started to get more corporatized and less state funded less publicly funded it made anyone who was kind of in the middle of i'm going to just do cognitive behavioral therapy and i want to do some kind of depth oriented woo woo a little bit out there whatever it split those worlds apart you know pretty quickly and you uh -huh. had a lot of people that got real weird uh, <laughs> And a lot of people <laughs> that got real cognitive in the hospital. That, what do you see as like the biggest way to sort of help? You look at things like Twin Flames, which looks so low, like low rent compared to, I mean, Keith Rainier really, like he was a lazy guy, but he had to work harder than, you know, something like Twin Flames University or Cult of the Mother God, you know. Oh God, Cult of the Mother God. Oh, that documentary, that was one of the most difficult documentaries about cults that I've ever watched. That was heartbreaking. It, it was pitiful. And, and, it, she, and it, I, I feel like it was really, um, really negligent of the filmmakers that they didn't have any commentary. I mean, they basically took the footage that these believers gave them and it was like an mm -hmm. ad for Mother God uh, with mm -hmm. no comment whatsoever. And, and it, it was just tragic and that these people are still believers as far as I know. And there's, you know, I, I, that was, that's a sad one. Oh boy. Well, you, you see things like that, that are, you know, definitely enabled from the internet existing 
definitely enabled by limitations and ability to afford healthcare. Um, and definitely enabled by everything kind of being an influencer MLM racket now. Right. What is that? Where does that go? I mean, Nexium <laughs> was not that long ago, and I don't think you could do another Nexium today. I don't think corporate seminars are the path to success. I think it does look more like Twin Flames or Cult of the Mother God. It's this kind of internet social media thing. How do we protect yeah. ourselves, our kids, our you know healthcare from that? Well, I, again, I think it's trying to. Uh, be aware of the red flags. It's trying to be, you know, ask critical questions. I mean, I always say to people, if you ask a question and they don't answer it, they turn it back on you. That's a bad sign. Like if you say, mm -hmm. well, what, what about blah, 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 and they say, oh, just take one more course and then you'll under, you know, then you then ask us the question. Well, you take one more course and you can't remember the question anymore, right? And so yeah, anytime, yeah. anytime there's that duplicity, you know, and also I think people move way too fast. Like, you know, you don't buy the first car you look at. So don't jump mm. into the first, whatever spiritual call, whatever kind of group it is, like take your time and investigate. And one of the advantages today of the internet is that there's so much information out there. There's bound to be people who left that group who will be talking about their experiences. And so you'll, ha you know, it's like when you buy a car, you check the blue book or whatever that thing is called. You drive around a few cars, you you know, you take your time. So people need to do the same thing when they're thinking about making that kind of personal commitment. Because mm -hmm. like you said, then there's the sunk cost. Once you're in, once you've spent thousands of dollars, once you've given up all your friends and your family on the outside, this has become your whole reality. It's going to be just that much harder to leave. Yeah. So, I mean, it took me five years to leave my group. I wanted to leave for five years and I couldn't do it. I mean, the door was there. I could not walk out the door. I was yeah. terrified and I had nothing. I had no resources. I had no money. I had a car that wouldn't make it over the Bay Bridge. I mean, it's like, and then they told me I was going to die in the street. So, you know, you just become immobilized. Well, and keeping so, you in poverty or keeping you in addiction or keeping you in emotional enmeshment or ideally as many as I can right. do is the point, you know, right. then that way yeah. you get to pretend there is freedom by saying, there's the door. If anyone doesn't like it, walk out it. Y'all staying right. here is supporting yeah. me by omission, you know? Right. And the Twin Flames, I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the the documentary Escaping Twin Flames on Netflix. I mean, if people haven't seen it, they should. Because this guy, it's so obvious. I mean, he says right there, oh, look at my Porsche. Look at my this. Bring me more money so I can, you know, he's just bought this incredible house in this little town in Michigan. I mean, he is just in my opinion, such a con artist. I mean, just bamboozling these he's young not trying that hard. women, you know. And it's just tragic. And the, this this young woman, Keely, who's in who's featured in the documentary, you know, when she finally got out, she was so in debt. You know, she and she had nobody. She had nothing. She had recruited her sister, and she felt so guilty about having done that. And you know, and now the group is even worse. You know, they're coercing people into these sex changes, and so young yeah. women are cutting off their breasts. They're having bottom surgery. They're growing those beards. It, the, and People the that are saying I'm not transgender, I don't want to be, I don't want to change. He's exactly. telling them that they have to. These are people who never in their lives dreamed of becoming the other gender. And so it's just tragic because once you do that, you can't, you know, your breasts aren't going to grow back. You know, once you do it, it's done. And the fact that they're getting away with that is just criminal, in my opinion. Well, so, and the energy around it was so strange because he doesn't try and hide the wealth. He doesn't try and okay. hide the agenda. He doesn't try and feign wisdom. I mean, right. he, he really, he reminded me of like one he of those guys. Go ahead. He couldn't feign wisdom if he wanted to. <laughs> well, like when I was in college, there were all these like Ron Paul, like libertarians that had like kind of long hair and would take mushrooms and play ultimate Frisbee. And it was like they were just like one joint away from realizing that they were God, kind of, you know, and yeah. that is the energy of that guy. You know, that okay. he's just like when he's revealing it, it's like, you know what it's going to be. And he has this kind of stupid, slimy grin. And he's like, guys, I figured something out. Actually, I'm Jesus. And it's just right. so like, yeah. who is but falling think, for this? Yeah. And, and I think if if people watch the documentary, it's only three episodes. And it's all original footage um, that they have, but you see him sort of getting meaner and meaner and more angry and yelling. Seeing at what he can get away with. 
Yeah, and that's what cult leaders do. Like the more they can get away with, the more they'll push the envelope and keep at that. And so, I mean, that was so obvious in the documentary. But the real concern is that baby. You know, they had a baby, and baby Grace. And he says right there, you know, he says, baby Grace is only going to have sex with God. And he's God. He believes he's God. So what does that say about the future of that baby? I mean, that to me is one of the biggest concerns. Well, and didn't they tell everyone that they were going to buy this land and they wanted them to move there yes. to have a commune? Is that still well, on the books? Yes. Oh, yeah. I was just there. I was just in Traverse City, Michigan, which is the town right next door. I did the, They brought Keeley and I, and we did this big event for the National Writer Series. And that town is now ready to roll against this group yeah. because they're saying they there's already 30 people who have moved there and now he's wanting to he's said this it's recorded he wants to buy a big plot of land and have everybody move there they've now registered as a church and he says right there he's doing it so that he doesn't have to pay people you know and he'll get the tax right off and and so he has no intention of you know shutting down or closing or slowing down and you know, people pay thousands for those courses. They they have fifty thousand followers around the world. Yeah. Fifty thousand. So yeah. even if even if a tenth of those move to that town, which is an adorable little town, Sutton's Bay, it, it's going to be it's you like know, the Rajneesh is. You know, you're going to have the have community versus. Yeah, that's his dream. So hopefully, things can happen before that takes place. Yeah. Well, it's scary, scary stuff. And it, it, do you see um, somewhere? Yeah, did your did your academic? Yeah, I mean, these things have gone on since the Bronze Age. It'll be what is the next generation iteration, and how do we prepare for it? But you know, do you see your academic focus, you know, changing over the course of of your you know work with this, or do you kind of feel like you're just doing the same thing, trying to figure out what it's going to look like tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, things have advanced, like I was saying earlier, like understanding the internet-based cults and things like that. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I mean, sometimes I get, I, I do do a lot of expert witness work, and that's really interesting because I get to really dig deep into something uh, when I'm working on a case like that in order to write my report. So, uh, and, I, and I enjoy doing those because I feel like at least we're getting some justice, right? We're getting someone their money back, or we're getting someone put like you know put in prison, whatever. Yeah. Um, so the the important thing I think is for people to, if they're going to leave, to think about what they can take with them that has evidence of the crimes. I mean, once you have evidence of the crimes, and almost all of these groups commit some crime or other, um, and then they get and, lazy because they they've right. pushed and when the you have, so far. Right, they're full of themselves. But when you have labor trafficking or sex trafficking, those are federal crimes. And so, you know, that's how we brought Ranieri down. Um, that's mm -hmm. how, you know, there's a big case, a couple of other cases now happening against the leader of this uh, Mexican church in, uh, which actually is worldwide, but the leader there was for three generations of leaders, the grandfather, the father, and now the son, they call themselves the apostle and they groom the women to send their daughter. Nine-year-old girls are sent into the bedroom with him. And this has been going on for decades. That guy is in prison on a very small sentence, but there's five more lawsuits against him. Yeah. So <clears throat> gathering evidence is really important. But <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure I'll be doing this till <clears throat> until I'm on my deathbed, which may be soon. <laughs> but <laughs> hope not. Uh, well, I have a brochure about this organization. Uh, if you're interested in uh, addressing some of your existential, oh, yeah, yeah, I can talk to yeah. you about my afterlife. <laughs> uh, now, I and I think you've done enough work with courts and with victims that you've probably seen it. But like you said, you'd never join a meditation cult, but you did have right. this kind of idealistic. I, I want to be given the most political tools to do the most good, and y'all are talking the best game here. It seems right. to me like whatever your shadow is, whatever you're running from, whatever the traumatic experience that you you know you can't quit reliving, but also don't know how to deal with from being a kid, or that you know the, the emotion that you want to avoid, you know whatever. I'm trying to throw out a couple different therapeutic models of language there so that people can recognize their style, but that is what 
informs how these people approach you and what you're susceptible for. And and, mm-hmm. and Nexium was an interesting thing and in that none of those people thought the same and he didn't talk to any of them similarly. You know, to some people, yeah. he was going to them and saying, I'm a magician wizard and my semen actually glows blue and is magic. Literally, right. he said that. I'm not making it. And then to other people, he was like, I'm a scientist. This is logical. Right. You're coming from right. a mystical cult, but we're going to get this patented because my idea is so right. brain smart. It's actually yeah. technology or something, you know? Um, and and you see, well, this person never was given attention from parents to be to have their ideas seen. And then this person is really, a, they have kind of a trickster archetype energy. They want to be able to go rabble rouse, you know, a Ba Anand Sheila type person. Like, he was able to get, and, and some of the guys that are that are effective at this stuff, especially hiding it in the wider collar areas, they know how to do that. I mean, could you speak to that? Or what, what do you, what well, is your spread? Well, I think what's interesting is that most cult leaders are really lazy, but they're all yeah. about power and control, and they're almost always some form of narcissist. Once they're malignant narcissists, that's when the really bad stuff happens, right? Because they have a little bit of a psychopathy. But hmm. they, all they need is to recruit the first few people because that's who will then go out and do the rest of the recruiting. I mean, Nexium was built because all of those actresses and actors and whatever brought in their connections, right? Brought in their money. He never left their- that tiny area. Like he left that 50 mile radius like twice in 15 years. Exactly. He wasn't exactly. in Europe and on these islands. He was like lounging in greasy socks on the couch, you know? Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> I mean, he's he's so typical of that kind of lazy cult leader, right? So, um, yeah, I think that I don't. I'm sorry, I forgot what the question was. But <laughs> oh, it was how how is your you know people's individual trauma used to kind of control them well, when these guys know, are the better ones approach people differently? They can clock that thing right. intuitively that you're running right. from, and right. they get you with that. Well, but and partly, <clears throat> I think. Excuse me. Partly what they do is create that trauma, right? They'll convince you that your parents were awful to you. They'll convince you that something bad happened to you. They're the ones who actually implant the trauma. I mean, they put you through, they make you feel like a piece of crap, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. when people leave, they have no sense of self. They have no self-esteem. They have no self-confidence because all of that is broken down. Because even though you've supposedly found salvation so to speak or or somebody who's going to take you there they don't accept you as you are they then have to tear you apart and that's part of that's what the indoctrination process is about it's like rip that person apart and they figure out what are the buttons to push right Mm -hmm. and so they you know when i got out of my cult i mean i had already been to college i was a fulbright scholar when i got out of my cult i i barely could figure out how to cross the street I mean, I, I didn't know how to open a bank account. I didn't. I, I was just mind boggled the whole time. I was terrified, you know. And so they create that. Um, yeah. So, but you know, some of them, of course, will appeal to maybe something that happened in your past, or that you had a shitty family, or whatever. Um, but. Well, you you it. sell the 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 poison as the cure to the thing that the person's bringing in, but I still I still think you have to get that initial diagnosis right. Some people are kind of longing for some kind of existential or mystical experience, you know, right. some right. And that, some sort of experience. Other people really just want tools to make the world better, and they want to be the right. most empowered in that. Right. You know, and yeah. There's a million presentations, but yeah, exactly. It varies. It's like what. You know, some sometimes people say, oh, well, those are just those seekers, you know. Well, we're all seekers. I mean, we are. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> we're humans. We're social animals. We want family. We want, you know, like I was saying earlier, meaning and purpose. It's not that there's some bunch of crazy seekers out there, and that's who gets into these groups. Any one of us can get into one of these groups, as I did, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that's what people need to recognize and honor, you know, that this applies to all of us. Um, well, and I want to be respectful of your time. Is there anything that you think, you know, if somebody wants to go out, this appeals to them, um, what's, what are, what are the books to start with? We can link to your uh, author page on Amazon or audible. And, right. um, you know, do you have a, uh, any other projects that you'd like, um, to, to, to let people know about and point them towards? Well, I do, I do have a nonprofit that I've, I started about two years ago called the Lalich Center on Cults and Coercion. 
Um, so if people have some free cash laying around, they can certainly go to that website, thelawlishcenter.org, and make a donation. Um, I have at least five books that I've written, um, like we were talking about, that that I think it's helpful to have those on your shelf in case you get involved or someone in your family gets involved, you know how to help. Um, and they're fun yeah. too. I mean, you're you're not like a, a real uh, pop psychology writer that takes all the academics out of it, but you're also not dry academic writer yeah. that you're just, yeah. a, a, I got to read it, do my homework. Yeah. It's nice down to earth stuff is in, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I've got my books there. And, you know, as you were saying, I've done a lot of podcasts, a lot of documentaries. People can always find me that way. Um, and, and I'm trying to cut back a little bit just because I've been doing this 35 years and because of my age, it's like, okay, now Yanya, <laughs> it's time to <clears throat> focus a little bit, <clears throat> but, um, you know, I'm still there for people and I'll carry on. And so, uh, one of, one of my, there's two things I, my main concerns, one is the children who are born and raised in cults because there's no social resources for them. And when they get out, if they manage to leave on their own or whatever, the, a lot of them don't know their real name. They don't have birth certificates. They don't know if they have relatives on the outside. They end up on the streets. There's a They're massive told amount. that they broke laws, that they're a felony because right. they were involved in sex work, so they can't go to the right. cops there's for a, help. And there's a massive number of suicides, which is just tragic. And and my other focus right now is to is to get this concept of coercion understood by law enforcement and the courts because I, I can't tell you how many times I'll hear from an authority, well, you know, she's an adult. If she wants to do that, that's fine. And they don't understand what it means to be under the control of someone in that way. And, and the courts seem to understand it when it comes to what they call undue influence of the elderly, right? The, the old woman gets coerced by the evil nurse to sign over her will to her and stuff like that. That the court understands. But when it comes to this kind of situation, they don't. So I'm trying to, you know, work on that and bring together the various organizations that are working on that and, and get coercion finally understood, where it, yeah. which has happened in a couple of other countries, uh, like the UK and New Zealand. Wisconsin. It, although it's still even there, it still only applies to domestic violence. So it has to be broadened to recognize these types of organizations. Could you apply legislation, something like a RICO law, like the with, with RICO cases, to be used against high control groups? If if somebody was well, an interpiring legislature. Well, yeah, there. I mean, a lot of these cases are RICO cases. Um, the one against Ramiri was, but. Um, it, it's still difficult to get, you know, that that's why I get hired as an expert witness to try to explain, or I, I work with people who, you know, I have a case where I'm going to go to the parole board and help this woman who's been in prison since she was 17 because of something she did that they told her to do. And she's now 70 and sits in her cell and knits and would never harm another human being ever, but she can never get paroled because, mm. because of this incident from, you know, 60 years ago. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work to be done in the, in the legal field. Well, and I just mean practically, instead of just education, which is great, you know, is there a mm -hmm. way that you could take something modeled after like a RICO, um, like case to actually put something on the books that would, uh, let you legally label, you know, a high control group or, or would that, is that not really possible? Does that require too much subjectivity? I think that that would be extremely difficult. Plus every state is going to have its own laws. So what we've got 50 states or 52, whatever it is, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. that's a massive, I mean, that's what the people who are fighting the troubled teen industry are working at because yeah. those are those horrible boarding schools and wilderness programs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, some of those organizations are fighting for legislation, but some of the legislation, the way it's written only in a sense gives credibility to those organizations. So they say, we're going to regulate them. Well, no, don't regulate them. Shut them down. Yeah. You can't regulate a cult. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did did you, uh, have you seen any of uh, some of the newer scholarship about how uh, a lot of those troubled teen industries started when Synanon fell apart? Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Synanon is the founder. Yeah, Synanon yeah. is, in my book, I did, in my book, Take Back Your Life, which just got reissued, I have a whole section. Yeah, I have a whole I'm section on the troubled teen industry. 
And there's a one article actually has a diagram that shows the map of how it grew out of Sinanon, how these all grew out of Sinanon, and then they branched off. But yeah, that was the, because it's all about attack therapy, which is what they did in yeah. Sinanon. Sit in the middle and have everybody attack you. And that's what they do in these troubled teen programs. And it's just, I mean, on top of other kinds of punishments and tortures. But um, yeah, Sinanon has a lovely history. <laughs> yeah, and that, that industry is so scary because so many of these communities, they're in rural places. They're usually run by, you know, one type of religious group or people affiliated with that type of religious group. And they are um, usually the, the only tax revenue for these tiny counties. So exactly. they're basically just incentivized to cover up murder yeah. and torture. Yeah. Um, so they're in, you know, they're in, I, I've got two cases right now in Montana. You know, they are, they're in these yeah, way out of the way. Sometimes they would take them to islands. There's been one, on you know, little islands in the Caribbean. Um, I didn't know that. I, all the ones I knew of were American West. Um, yeah, no, most of them are. I mean, there there were also. I mean, look at Straight was was one of the biggest. That was in New York, um, yeah. New Jersey. There was a one called Kids of New Jersey that got shut down. But that yeah, but primarily they send them to these remote areas. It makes it and it makes it harder for them to escape. You know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, people have escaped and they're out in the middle of nowhere, and then they just get caught again and brought back, and then they're treated even worse. So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, people need to learn. There's actually a documentary coming out March 5th on Netflix, uh, which I which I happen to be in, but it's called The Program, and it'll be ab about the trouble teen industry. Um, yeah. And of course, well, you know, our insurance companies are paying for it. You know, it's... It why, really, it's why can you not pay for somebody who goes through sexual assault to have a therapist? Right. But I can pay to choose to send my kid because I found right. a Misfits album under their bed to right. the middle of Ohio to be tortured. Can yeah. anyone uh, want to speak to me from my the insurance company on that <laughs> position? <laughs> <laughs> One of them seems to be a little bit more evidence based to me, uh, yeah. since that's what we're we, that's what they claim to be doing. Yeah. Well, well this is see, great. This has been great, Joel. I really appreciate your time so much. It's so nice to, to talk to you, and um, I uh, will link to all of those projects in the show notes. And um, whenever you get the uh, courses for therapists available through your absolutely. own profit, if you'd send them to me, we'll put those out on our social media also. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for your persistence. I think we've been trying to do this since last summer. <laughs> so. yeah. Uh, yeah, you were supposed to kick off the cult documentary thing. We've tried to slow it down, but uh, you weren't the, the tip of the spear, but it'll still be included on there. So thank you for your time. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Joel.